Good afternoon. It's still morning for me. I'm out in California. Um, I want to thank you all for joining me. And before we begin, I do want to um, continue to pray for everyone who has lost loved ones from this virus. I do also want to thank all those from the medical community to the truck drivers, to the farmers, um, to the grocery clerks, to people who are working on the takeout um, from the food, everybody that's making sure the country's still working through this. We, we cannot thank them enough for what they're doing, especially on the front line, especially all those in the medical community as well. Um, I put together, together a group of slide decks since we cannot be in, um, in person with one another, that we're on the phone. I thought that could work a little better, some of the points that I would bring up. Um, one of the first slide decks that I would go to is um, some of the data that we have here from John Hopkins. Um, as we see, we are still suffering from the virus, but we're making progress. Uh, Scott Gottlieb said today, I think on CNBC, on a plateau. Um, there are a couple of things I take from this John Hopkins numbers that are from a positive sense of where I look at it, we had a downward trend, a little uptick. But at the same time we're doing that, we're increased the number of testing. And I just think from the other day, we're at 5 million, now we're over 6 million. We're doing almost more than a million a week. And if we're, if we're broadening out the test and we don't have that, that slope of going upward, I view that as a very positive, like a flattening. And as tests continue to uh, grow. It's very important for all of us to, so we get to that point that we can be back working as well. If you look at the second slide, or I guess um, we'll call it the third one, um, very sad news we got again today, um, the jobs, the historic job loss. We're now at 30 million. Um, this trend shows one of the worst economic damages um, coming at us and where millions of Americans are suffering. Uh, we look first quarter, GDP contracted by 4.8% in the first quarter. Looking at the second quarter is predicted to be one of the worst in our history. Um, it's important to reflect really what has Congress done so far working with this administration over $3 trillion in direct congressional relief. You combine that with what the Fed Reserve is doing, that's about $7 trillion into the economy. A lot of it is implemented, more has to be implemented. Um, that is why I always refer to it as our Marshall Plan for Main Street. Um, and if you look at the fifth slide there, I'm talking about PPP. Uh, in that first group, we did 1.6 million loans. Um, we calculated that about that's 30 million jobs saved, nearly 5,000 lenders. And remember, for the 7A program, when we started this, there was only about 8, 1,800 lenders approved. So the time we're putting money out approving lenders, expanding who can lend. We want to make sure community banks, credit unions, FinTech was even in the process. And looking back at that, uh, in PPP2, we've now approved almost a million more loans. The volumes of loans nearly um, are amazing. There's 5,300 lenders now from that process of um, 1,800. We've done about another $90 billion. But if you look at where the money's going from all those that are able to lend the money, um, about 587,000 of those loans come from, come from 10 billion or less lenders. So that's, that's kind of the smallest. So you're going to get from 10 billion to 50 billion, about 206,000 of those loans, 160,000 of the loans come from banks over 50 billion. So the smallers are producing more of the loans and that, that's a positive sign because the smaller banks are dealing directly with the smaller businesses out there. Um, that's very, very important of what we're trying to see and what we're trying to see happen here. Um, it is historic from the ability to save 30 million jobs when you got 30 million out there um, um, <coughs> that are unemployed. So we're going to have to do much more. Um, I sent around to all of our members. Um, there was this great article by Mark Andreessen, if any of you know Mark Andreessen, um, He's out in Silicon Valley, very smart individual, created a lot of companies and runs, creates a lot of companies now. But he said it's really um, a time to build. Every step of the way uh, to everyone around us, we should be asking the question, what are, what are you building? What are you building directly or helping other people to build or teaching other people to build, taking care of people who are building? If the work you're doing 
isn't either le lending, um, leading to something being built or taking care of people directly, we failed you. And we need to get you in a position, an occupation, a career where you can contribute to building. That means from all aspects. Um, one thing I had done that I believe I sent out to all of you as well um, is an essay that I put out there that how do we start rebuilding this country and some of the great lessons that we need to learn right now. One of the biggest lessons I think that we need to learn is the dependency that the world has on China when it comes to PPE and medicine. We did a conference call this week with all of our members. I had a couple experts on there, Rosemary and others, about what, what China has been doing to, to control different supply chains uh, throughout the world. In the medical supply chain, they actually have a monopoly on. Um, and this essay is how do we go about breaking it? So when we look to, now that we have $7 trillion going to the economy, when we talk about more legislation, this is part of the recovery legislation I think that we need to do. We need to start, when we consider this phase four legis legislation, I want the Republicans and the Democrats to be very serious about addressing this issue. That's why I'm spending policy conferences over the phone, um, advising members, educating members on how big China has become in many of these supply chains and that we have to break them. Looking specifically at areas that we can improve, constant improvement, the modernizing of the strategic national stockpile. Specifically, two goals must be achieved within this country. We modernize the stockpile and we bring pharmaceutical manufacturing back to the U.S. If you currently look at our strategic national stockpile, it is unable to transfer a sale to other federal agencies. So what's happening when you build this stockpile, it tends to lead to remaining on the shelf until after things expire. What I've talked about with my I've been flushing it out in a number of different calls and building other people in, allow the private sector to keep the stockpile, the federal government to build the place next to them, could buy so much of it, and then each year they can sell it back in so we have a modernized stockpile every single year. Um, and we could go to our allies. We can tell our allies they'd be, that we'd be willing to store their stockpile in America too because the rule of law we're finding with China what they have done to so many people. Withholding, um, withholding medical equipment, trying to get Huawei in, trying to get you not talk about that it came from Wuhan, all these different influences that China's trying to do that America would not, that we could modernize our stockpile, it would help us to keep the supply chain back in America, it would be a sufficient one and enough for any, um, <laughs> any virus coming into the future, but it would also never expire, it would be modern in the process, and we would have the capability for the public-private partnership that already be up to date. Um, and finally, we need to really look at a bold deregulatory uh, agenda to bring manufacturing back to the United States. I mean, um, this would include expensing tax incentives, just ways to escape, to unshackle the, the regulatory capture, because we have to look at it from a different perspective. You can't say you just want the supply chain back. You know, in America, we don't, we don't make aspirin. We don't make penicillin, the very basic things that... Um, China has control of. Well, well, how do you bring it back? Because what China will do by having a communist country and others, they'll go and dump in a market to break the private sector to be able to do it as well. And then if you compound that on top of it with a regulatory system that takes five to seven years to build a manufacturing plant, and China comes in and dumps within a market of something that you want to build, it breaks you from the ability to do it. So we have to think collectively together. We need to cut that down. We cannot be sitting here and say it's going to take you five to seven years to build and think we're going to break them of their supply chain because where will they be 10 years from now and others? We need to get that down at least to 18 months to a year so people know they can make this happen. And these aren't just from a concept of a Republican ideas. These are American ideas. This is something that we have to look at collectively. If we're going to seriously be able to build serious about future legislation, serious about recovery, the lessons that we've learned, we've got to make sure that we never repeat the challenges that we had now. Breaking supply chain from, from China, never allowing them to have that great of influence, looking at different supply chains now that maybe not deal with the virus. If you're sitting and looking at uh, in South Dakota that they um, 
China owns a manufacturing of our food. How much of the food chain do they control? How much of, uh, are they buying into our, our energy sector as well? We, we should look at every element of industry within America and analyze what percentage does China have control over that from critical minerals and others for us to be able to produce um, and secure the American America for safety. Those are fundamentals that I think we need to have happen. Um, and thinking about some of your questions may be, I have spoken to the speaker twice, spoken to uh, Leader Hoyer numerous times. Um, I've just, uh, he called me back right now, but we're doing this press conference, I told him I'll call him a little later. Uh, working on how do we make Congress get back and running. I know the Democrats say we're open and we're not. One thing I know is doctors go to work every day. Congress is not. Um, the delivery drivers continue to work every day, but Congress is not. Um, you've got from the store clerks, you've got every element going to keep this country working. I believe Congress is essential. That's why I sent a letter to the speaker more than about two weeks ago now I understand that you're looking at states beginning to open up, but no state opens up completely. I had a conference call yesterday with the California delegation from our Senator Feinstein, Speaker Pelosi, to Gavin Newsom. And this is a question I raised to, to Governor Newsom as well. California is a very diverse state. We're large. We're 40 million people. We're 12% of the nation's population. We, um, America is not exactly the same. If I looked at the data, and this is probably a week old, unfortunately, the deaths that occurred from this virus that we never wanted to have happen, 55% of last week was from New York and New Jersey. How can we do this on a safe manner to make sure that we have the tracing, that we know when we begin to open up, we've got to walk, we've got to crawl before we walk and walk before we run. But in those meantimes, we've got to be prepared if a hot spot comes back up, that we're prepared to be able to tackle that, you know, but make sure that but how can we make sure Congress can work from a central point of view and move forward? Well, one of the proposals I laid out to the Democrats as well, and um, from that letter, the speaker had put together a committee of six members, three Republicans and three Democrats, Denny McGovern, Zoe Lofgren, myself, Tom Cole, and Rodney Davis. And we've uh, met when we were in D.C., and we had a conference call here um, back in the district this week. I proposed don't bring all of Congress back at once. Let's bring some committees back. We want to keep social distancing. You've got armed services that need to deal with the National Defense Authorization Act. We know how important that is. Um, this has not stopped Iran from putting their boats against us. This has not stopped um, China from trying to say they're pushing us out of the South China Sea. This has not stopped Russia from buzzing our aircraft carriers and others. And we cannot give a false impression out there that America is not prepared and we should not slow our time for preparedness or others. This is a critical bill that we do every single year. So what if the uh, armed services came back? They could have met, they can meet in the chambers or they can meet in the auditorium. More than enough space for social distancing. Uh, I've talked about uh, with Skinny Hoyer the idea that let's, let's pledge together no political poison pills. Let's just focus on policy. If somebody wants to play a political game, both sides vote those down and let's stick to policy. Let's work and get that bill done. We could do that a number of different days. We don't have to go late into the night. It's challenging because the public can't be there, so let's make sure the press is there. Um, testing continues to improve if there's concern. I think people can be tested to be able to be in there. Get that work done, then you've got a product before you call somebody back. Transportation has word up, same type of thing. Pick a big room, be able to do that. Small business had a hearing. I would bring back the uh, subcommittees on appropriations and give them bigger rooms, have them do the work. So then what will happen is you'll have product that needs to be voted on by Congress from appropriations is our responsibility from national defense, from WERDA, from others. And you don't have everybody back there at once. But as these bills get done, you can pinpoint when they need to be voted on and you can bring members back. So maybe all the members are not back there for an entire week. They're there for a few days to vote. You can, we know that we're all in three buildings from Rayburn, Longworth, and Cannon. We know the size of all those rooms. We can limit the number of staff within each so you have social distancing. We can only bring a couple back. There are ways to do this safely by working with the medical community and also making sure Congress is doing the job that needs to happen. 
Um, and I hope that we'll be able to do that. I know um, it is something that can work. I know the subcommittee, uh, one of the subcommittees on appropriations, Tom Coles, um, uh, Labor HHS will come back next week and start their work. They can uh, allow witnesses into that as well, doing it in a social distancing in a safe manner, and we can get this process going. Unfortunately, um, I don't see as though the Democrat leadership has agreed to any of this to make this move forward, and it continues to linger out there. And I don't. I think the American public would like this to see us do our job. So with that, let me stop and operator tell us how we take questions and we can answer all those for you. Thank you. We'll now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one. You will be prompted to record your name, so please be sure to unmute your phone. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one. One moment for your first question. Our first question comes from Mike DeBonis with the Washington Post. Your line is open. Uh, hey, Mr. Leader, thanks for the, doing the call uh, and thanks for the update on the rules discussions. Uh, you may, I don't know if you saw uh, the speaker's press conference, she indicated she's prepared to move forward with the proxy voting uh, when the House comes back, whenever that is. Uh, I wanted to ask you about that, your reaction to that and whether that is something you are willing to negotiate on and second is she has said in the past couple of days that she has consulted with the attending physician in ma making these decisions regarding the house schedule. I wanna know if you had spoken to the attending physician, do you agree with the concerns that the, the speaker has put forth and uh, uh, the risks that would be entailed by bringing the house back with all the staff uh, 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 in, 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 in full? Thank you. My great question. We, we would not want to do anything without doing it safely. That's why in my letter, I do not say bring the entire Congress back and staff back at once. Remember, you crawl before you walk and you walk before you run. So let's be prepared and let's see what we can do, just as states are doing it out there. So if you brought just committees back and you're not bringing all the committees at once, I gave you an example of three committees of work that needs to get done right now. Um, if you have these committees to come back, they don't have to meet in their regular committee rooms. One, I think they're probably too small for them for social distancing. So that's why you only bring a few back where they can use the chambers, they can use the auditorium. Wide, vast areas for social distancing. So that's in a safe manner, especially when you work with the medical community and others. If you watched how we were able to vote last time, we did it in a very, um, I thought a manner that worked quite well, but alphabetical, you know, when to show up, you were able to go forward, um, you're able to get work done, critical to the American public, just as this is too. So staff is not there, only a select number of staff because of committee. Um, you don't have all the members there, only those members in, in that those committees would be working. If you brought everybody back today, which was unusual that when I first heard the speaker and the leader said, okay, we're all coming back on May 4th, well, what were we going to vote on? Were you just going to bring everybody back? That's why I want to look at a thoughtful way of doing it. Bring committees back, do work, have the bills done, and then you tell people to come back. So once you start committees working, you know how you can do this safely. Then you would go to the next phase, that you would bring more committees back uh, that would have to get other work done. You could then maybe start a process if you really needed to, uh, Monday through Wednesday are just these committees, right? You select which committees. On Thursday and Friday is when we vote in the House. So members aren't there the entire week. You're limiting the number of staffers who could be into the building based upon the size of your office. So you have social distancing. So that is the way when you talk about with the medical community and others, the best way to go about doing it. And then you continue to keep, I watched, um, if you're, if you're social distancing, but when you're walking in the halls, you're wearing the masks and others. Um, I had spoken to the speaker. I know she wanted to do the proxy before in my conversations. These are the main concerns I gave uh, to the speaker at all. And that's why she put the committee of six together to see if we could work through this. Um, I have a real concern if you go to proxies if you look, and I don't have the number right in front of me, but if you look at the number of people who came back, it was a pretty good number. Uh, the numbers who were missing was not that much higher than on an average missing time. 
um, on both sides. Um, but you also found um, on proxies, one person could hold 200 proxies if they wanted to. Um, and people lend their power to their elected official, to their congresswoman or congressman, and they hold them accountable. They don't lend their power to another member for a voice. I understand completely. There are members who can have certain challenges. You could be in a group that they've had lung problems on that they can't be there. Um, and they shouldn't be in that process. And maybe we can work something out. But the idea that from a sunset, from somebody holding it all the time, now the, the, many of the Democrats want to do all of this remotely, committees and others. Uh, I don't see how you negotiate a national defense authorization from nuclear and others um, over the technology that we have today. Um, we, we were doing a, a meeting of our six. Um, I consider my, myself pretty advanced in technology. I had, we were doing it by Microsoft Teams. I had three computers that used it before go in and I put it onto my phone when the, when the computers wouldn't work. Um, and then my phone, the, the, the house system blocked me from my phone being used because it was my private phone. That's when one's plan going through. So how would you do this and how would you debate the national security of America and you think someone's not going to come in and others. I, I just, we're not prepared for that. I know the Democrats felt Iowa that they could do this all by an app and found out they were wrong. Um, I believe if you're just going back with the committees, you can get this done. Look, you now have 30 million Americans who are out of work. I don't think Congress should sit back. Um, Congress is essential and we can do this in a safe manner. I want to emphasize safe. When I looked at uh, the first quarter's GDP, if you look, nearly half of the first quarter decline in GDP was attributed to health care because there's certain things we did to prepare for virus We eliminated all these elective surgeries and others, which, which, which uh, put, prepared so the hospital can bring people in. Well, now we're past that. We have an opportunity. And that, that would be some pent-up um, need in, in the economy as well. How can we open that up in a safe manner? That would change economics at the same time. So you can look at these different items, and Congress can do the same. So those who sit back and say, oh, I can't do it because I can't bring everybody back at once, they're not being thoughtful about how the states and everybody else are doing it too. There is a way to do this, and the answer should not just be no. Next question, operator. Our next question comes from Julie Grace. I'm sorry, Julie Grace Brusky. Your line is open. No, your line's not. Just a moment. Now your line's open. Sorry about that. Oh, uh, Carolina McCarthy. Uh, yesterday, Speaker Pelosi named her choices for the Select Committee on Coronavirus, and I was wondering if you plan to select anyone to be on there, and if so, what the timing on that looks like. Yeah, I've, I've had a couple conversations with the speaker on this. I told her from the very beginning, I don't know why she would need this committee. As many of you know, and you followed it, we already have an oversight committee. In the CARES Act, we produced three new entities for accountability. One happened to be one with inspectors general, one the presidential appointee serving for five years confirmed by the Senate, and one from a congressional one. Every single one of those are not political. OK, inspector generals decide upon their own. The president appoints, the Senate confirms. And in the congressional one, all four leaders appoint somebody. And then McConnell and Pelosi pick a fifth person who is chair. Not one side or the other is weighted. We've made those uh, picks of the four, and they're deciding on who's going to become the chair. Uh, in the House, Republican, it's French Hill. The Democrat side is Donna Shalala. And they are to report to Congress every 30 days. When the speaker first told me she wanted to do this, she was concerned about price gouging when it came to PPE, personal protection equipment, masks, and others. Well, I said, because of that time frame, how are you going to do this? How are you going to vote on this? Why don't we work with the attorney general to go after anybody with price gouging? And she got really upset with me, didn't think that was that role. Um, when she came back, she had already selected who could become chair of it without ever telling me what the mission of it is. 
Now she picked Jim Clyburn. Jim Clyburn is a very smart political person. He's credited with getting Joe Biden a nomination when he was when Joe Biden was going to fall and he turned South Carolina around. He's also the individual who told everybody in his conference he's elected the, the third highest person uh, as majority whip. He's majority whip. They lost the majority and he kept the job. You've got to be politically smart to be able to keep a job as majority whip and losing the majority. He then went on to come back, stayed as a whip. Not Joe Biden, the nominee, but he told all of his members that the coronavirus is a perfect opportunity to restructure government into their liberal view. So politically, he's smart. He wants to use things politically. Um, and she's trying to tell me this is a policy uh, one. Uh, I then viewed it and told her very clearly that I viewed this as just another impeachment um, committee. It is the only one of, oh, that is looking at from a standpoint of um, that we created from CARES, this one is not created after CARES, that is weighted. There's more Democrats than there are Republicans. There are nobody from the administration and there's no senators. It's purely a political appointed group. Then she says, oh no. I said, well, let me see who you appoint. She appoints Maxine Waters. Maxine Waters advocated for impeaching the president before he's even sworn in. Maxine Waters advocates that people go and confront in almost a violent form people that she fundamentally disagrees about philosophically when they're elected officials. Encourage people to do that. They select Raskin, Congressman Raskin. Let, let, let's look and see what he has done. Well, he is the person that represented all the Democrats to go to rules committee to actually bring forth the impeachment proceedings inside the House. Two days before the president was even inaugurated, he, he at a rally said, let's impeach the president. So this is no different than what they have done every other time they created something to try to impeach the president. Um, I was clear with the speaker. I'm having, I'm not convinced yet that we even participate in something like this. We're going to participate in everything that is, that is fair in the process that has Senate uh, and has the house equal weighting. That's why we're playing chill that reports back to us. I'll make the decision whether we're going to participate probably next week. Because uh, this is not viewed as something that's working for the accountability of the American public. It's viewed as purely a political operation that they chose at a time. They chose who the chair was to restructure before they even could lay out what the mission is. They voted on it without even giving the public what the mission of this to be. They waited it to be one-sided. They didn't allow the Senate in as well. Um, she can argue anything she wants, but it's purely political even from the people that she appointed. So I'll let you all know what uh, my decision is next week. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Melanie Zanona with Political, Politico, sorry. Your line is open. Uh, hi, Leader. Thanks so much for doing this call today. Um, I was wondering, when lawmakers do come back, do you think that lawmakers should be wearing masks in the Capitol? And I noticed that you and some of the other GOP leaders didn't wear masks last week, for example. Um, why is that? Well, if you notice where we did not wear masks is when we had social distancing. So a mask is to protect you from the social distancing. Um, I had been tested the day before. Um, when you were speaking from the microphone where people were sitting on the floor, there was more than six feet distance from any individual. If you watch me here, if I go someplace in a store or others, you'll always see me wearing a mask because there's not the social distancing within there. Uh, we made sure with on the floor that you had the social distance. It was um, not mandated that you had to, from the medical community, that you had to wear it on the floor. Uh, at the same time, I watched the speaker when she spoke from the microphone, she didn't wear it. So, so people had the ability to do it and have to based upon the social distancing. So what do you think the protocol should be for lawmakers? Do you think they shouldn't be required to wear it in certain circumstances then? Well, right now, I mean, I'm not a doctor. The medical community put out that um, if the social distancing is there, they are not mandating that you have to wear a mask. You have the option that you can or you don't have to. Okay, as thank you. As long as you have that distance. And uh, I, that's what the medical community uh, recommended to us. I want to do everything as safe as we possibly can. That's why we continue to consult with them. 
Got it. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Aton Wallace with KGET News. One more. Your line is open. Which is a fabulous hey. TV station inside my district. Go ahead, Aton. <laughs> Hey, Lita McCarthy. Good. Hey, thank you for the uh, kind words. Uh, you know, um, I just wrapped up a great interview with a uh, Valley Baptist Church, uh, Pastor Roger Spradlin, uh, who, of course, uh, uh, you and your office were very helpful in setting that up. So thank you for that. Uh, good news there uh, is 200 jobs have been saved you know, over the next eight weeks for their payroll. Um, now, would you remind me, uh, you mentioned that earlier in the presentation, um, how many loans have been approved in total across America and, and how many applications are, are pending? And, and what's your message for those who, uh, uh, like the owner of uh, Casey Steakhouse, for instance, who say they're still waiting or that the, the loan is still, the application is still pending? What is your message for them? Oh, good question. Okay, so what we're talking about is PPP, the Paycheck Protection, which goes to small businesses that have 500 employees or fewer. And just for historical purposes, the reason why that number is picked, that's always what small businesses then get recreate. In creating this program, it has never been done before. And this is was the thought process. If we made everybody go through the SBA, it would take forever. In fact, in the 14 days of the beginning of this program, we, we put through as many loans as the SBA has done in 14 years. Think about that. In 14 days, 14 years. At the same time we're doing that, the way that we found to do it was let the businesses, they have relationships with their local banks, let the local banks be the ones. SBA guarantees it, pays a fee, and so the banks are willing to do it. So in doing so, but there are only 1,800 banks at the beginning of this who are already qualified for a 7A program. So we said, let's expand that. So we're, we're approving banks at the same time. We've got to make sure not for fraud. There's going to be some, but we want to be able to catch it. Uh, we've increased that over 5,600 from 1,800 at the same time we're producing loans because they already have a relationship there. We did more than $1.6 million in that first segment before the money ran out when the Democrats held it up. I think we've ha we had over a million loans sitting there. I know I don't have the exact number right today, but they were moving them rather rapidly in the process. Uh, we expanded it beyond just business because we know how important nonprofits and churches are to dealing with the community. So uh, we wanted to open it up for them as long as they had less than 500. We expanded it from credit unions being able to loan. We really focused on the smaller banks, the community banks, and they've done the majority of all the loans. And then we even came into FinTech as a technology and others. And this was a whole new operation. So a lot of this hinges on who you bank with. Some were more productive than others. I think Wells Fargo capped themselves early and hurt people. So I had a lot of local businesses, Aethon, who came to me that you would know um, that have done long history from cleaners, uh, from our dry cleaners to where we buy our mattresses, locally owned. They had to shift and go to one of the local community banks. Uh, if there's a challenge, like with Casey Steakhouse and others, I don't know who they went through with their loan. Uh, I would walk through with their bank or even look to maybe you've got to look at some, at some other local bank to actually help, and I could work with them personally. But um, this has proven one of the best successes here. More than 30 million jobs were saved in the first segment. Unfortunately, when the Democrats held it up and we asked two weeks prior just to add more money to it, we had another number of 4.4 million unemployed, which I know a lot of those would not have been, just as you're talking where the church would have had to lay off 200 people. And think about that. Uh, think about how much that church and so many others produce and feed and educate in our community is the importance of it. And so this is critical in this time. And um, I can get you the up-to-date numbers. I'll get those a little later today. But I appreciate Thank that. Thank you, Congressman. Next question. Thank you so much. Next question comes from Manu Raju for CNN. Your line is open. Your line is open. You may want to check your mute button. You want to try the next one? Then come back to him. Sure, we'll go to Carolyn McKee with Fox News. 
Hey, Lita McCarthy. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, I wanted to ask you about saying you're not convinced that you should participate in something like the oversight um, committee. However, however, wouldn't you be concerned if you guys end up delegating another trillion dollars for CARES too, including some funding for state and local governments? Wouldn't you want oversight of that? That's a fabulous question. And let's let's go back and let's walk through your question. Your question to me was, would I be concerned in not participating in oversight? The first answer is that, hell yes, I'd be concerned about not oversight. I want oversight. That's why when we passed CARES 1, we created three new entities of oversight beyond all the oversight. So appropriations have an oversight committee. We have an oversight committee itself. This new special committee is under the oversight committee itself. It's inside the oversight committee. We, we have a congressional oversight committee that I appointed French Hill to, who used to work at Treasury, who's, who's been part of, a, a owned a bank as well. Uh, probably one of the best statements you have, a, a statement inside Congress itself. Then you have Donna Shalala. They're going to report to us every 30 days. I meet with French individually on this of what things are going on. We have the inspector generals who are picking a general who are picking among themselves to look after it. We gave the GAO another $25 million. The president's appointing one. It's being confirmed that we added more money to as well. So when you talk about oversight, we have a bond redundance, and I want to participate, and I want to lead in every way possible when it comes to oversight. Now, your question, if it's about Nancy Pelosi's committee, Let's look who she put on the committee. If she was concerned about oversight, would she announce the committee and the chair without telling you what the mission of the committee was about? Tell me the four things the committee is supposed to do. Because when she announced this, the only thing she announced was Jim Clyburn was going to be in charge of it. Jim Clyburn has only said that the coronavirus is a chance to restructure government. Well, that's not oversight to me. That's a restructuring of the government. It seems like he's about something else than oversight. Then she goes and puts on Maxine Waters. Then she also puts on Raskin, who even in the last week just went toe-to-toe with Jim Jordan just in a screening match. I mean, if, if you want to take a reputation of different members that she put onto this committee on what they care most about, I don't, I don't judge them on, on them fighting for things they believe in, but it seems that they're very, very political individuals. I haven't seen him asking about oversight. I've only seen him walk, talking about impeachment and the care of impeachment. That's what he's, Raskin has made a reputation on, even before the president was sworn in. That's what he took to the rally to say that he wanted to accomplish before the president was sworn in, and you put him on the committee. So what is the real intent of this committee? So if you're questioning me if I care about oversight, hell yes, I do, and I'm going to go above and beyond. And that's why we participate in every committee that is oversight and weighted correctly. But if it's a political committee, I'm going to take a pause. I'm going to look for the real intent. Tell me what it's about before I make a decision on what we do. Because as as we go to conferences, press conferences later, you probably won't refer to this committee as an oversight committee or anything when it comes to accountability. This will be no different than you had to rename the Intel Committee the Impeachment Committee. This will be no different than what Nadler started to do in his committee. We've watched this pattern time and time again. And every time that we, when we moved the Intel Committee, how did that all start? With the speaker going and naming it without anybody voting on it, going against the rules, the same way that this committee started. So there's a pattern of behavior that the Democrats do when they just want to play politics and impeach, and they're following the same pattern when it comes to this committee as they did with all the others. So I think your question, and when it comes to oversight, yes, I want as much oversight as possible. Uh, I have a follow-up, if you have a moment, um, on state and local funding. Uh, How delegate money for state and local funding – how can that be ensured that that money is not just a bailout from existing, like an existing issue? Well, first and foremost is, is how you go when Congress, if the Congress allocates, you can set frameworks around it, right? What money can be spent for and what money cannot be spent for. You can do it directly through grants. Um, 
lots of times you're going to have a real problem. If you go and apply this directly just to a state, to a governor itself, and you give them a lot of flexibility, they'll use it to pay off other things and not help the cities and counties that people really need it. So why don't we open it up to more of a city and county where the governor is not taking his 25% off the top? Why don't you say that it can't pay for any pensions or anything else, that it only has to be for COVID? Have people sign up and show the accountability of what they lost during the time period. We know when COVID started, when individuals shut down, and when they open back up. Let's see your accounting from that purposes of what it is, and we can wait it and go through. I mean, Congress needs to think about how they would supply the money. We have already supplied $500 billion to states, $500 billion. And put that in one month, we did that. And put that in perspective, we spend roughly a little over $600 billion for an entire year in Medicare. The states are still going to continue to get their FMAP at 6.2%, the highest they've ever had as the year progresses, as long as this is going on. So, For states, and this is my concern of why I I like your question and why I think it's the right question. On that Sunday when Speaker Pelosi came in and held up the first CARES Act, um, one of the reasons, one of the things she brought up is not just changing election law, but she was concerned about pension. Well, these are actions that the states have refused the mismanagement of their own state, and if they think they're going to make hard-earned taxpayers pay for their mistakes, they're wrong. And that's why there has to be uh, a framework and requirements around any money we're going to provide. And we've got to make sure if we're going to provide money, money goes to where it's supposed to go. That it's not that someone's taking some percentage off the top. And that's a real concern to me that if I just sent that money directly to Sacramento, would Bakersfield or Porterville Porterville or Lancaster ever get that money? The one that needs it for their first responders or others. Show me the challenge and the account, um, the financial risk of what took place during COVID, and let's put it appropriately to what we're dealing with. Thank you so much, sir. Next, we'll go to Joe Khalil with Next Star Media. Your line is open. Uh, hi, Mr. Leader. Thank you for uh, taking the call. Um, today, we heard. Uh, Congressman Clyburn talking about the importance of broadband um, when we're talking about a a larger infrastructure bill, something that the president has also uh, been in support of. I'm just wondering if you've had any um, further talks with the president about what exactly uh, infrastructure might look like if it is part of the next spending measure or if it's, uh, you know, part of CARES 2. I thought the president has quite a bit of infrastructure. This president really, uh, he, he wants to be able to build build in the correct manner in America. And one of the biggest concerns he has with building is that it doesn't take a decade to make it happen. Broadband is a very big discussion. We're finding a broadband problem when kids are out of school right now. There are certain segments of America that you say, oh, learn from home, online and others, and they're having a real challenge with it. So I think broadband is an appropriate discussion for us to have, regardless of whether we're doing a, a infrastructure bill or not, the need for broadband across America especially in the rural areas. Next question up there. Okay. Our next question comes from Sarah Weyer with LA Times. Your line is open. Hi, hey, Mr. Leader. Thanks for adding a call. I, my question was where you stand when it comes to liability protections that uh, Leader McConnell is hoping for in this next bill. I agree with McConnell 100%. We need to give individuals the protection. Um, the last thing we need um, is an as- uh, aspect of coming back um, and slowing down our ability to, to do what we need to have happen. Um, what I have found that it puts fear into people. Let me give you one example. In the very first bill that we took up in supplemental, 3M makes a number of masks, and some of them are different, right? Surgical masks are a little tighter, and then you have the, or is it N75 or 79 Well, then you have these other masks that you wouldn't, you wouldn't use inside the um, surgical room, but the medical units could use them uh, for testing and everything else. But 3M would not be willing to sell it because they're going to they're gonna get a lawsuit against them. The trial lawyers wanted to sue them. So we went to the Democrats, and that would have supplied us with PPE of millions of more PPE that month. 
The Democrats said no in the supplemental. So we, we, we laughed at how much of time before we got to that second bill. And we asked again in the second bill. And, and at the very end, we agreed to even a weaker language, but enough where 3M would willing to have all these other masks that were sitting there that the medical units needed right then to finally be able to sell. But it was those trial attorneys that got the Democrats to say no, especially in that first bill that slowed it up. Um, and I would hate to see all this coming back on individuals just trying to do the very best they can. And I think that's critical because what will happen is it'll harm what I feel uh, Americans and the economy and everywhere else are going because people will hold back out of fear of a lawsuit in the future instead of going out and caring and treating something right now. Thank you. Next question, Alfred. Uh, yes, this question comes from Julio Rosas with Town Hall Media. Your line is open. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Sp uh, Mr. Leader. Um, I was wondering if uh, you have a reaction uh, from uh, Speaker Pelosi's comments this morning regarding uh, her defense of uh, former Vice President Joe Biden and the allegations made against him by Tara Reid. Uh, she said that uh, she supports Joe Biden and that she is satisfied with how he has responded to the allegations, which is a bit of a problem given the fact that he hasn't uh, addressed the allegations directly, despite all, a lot of uh, media interviews in between uh, since the allegations first came up. So I was just wondering if you had a reaction to that defense, uh, given how the uh, Democrats' uh, whole uh, reaction to this has been wildly different to, say, the allegations made against uh, Justice Kavanaugh during his confirmation. She's being a hypocrite. You cannot say that Joe Biden, if you're just taking it on its nature, has she ever talked to Tara Reid? Has she ever looked into it? Joe Biden has not responded to this. Um, you can't say one thing about every other time she's commented about any accusation and now say it. She endorsed Joe Biden after knowing the Tara Reid situation. So did anybody follow up with a question to the speaker? When you went to endorse Joe Biden, did you first look at this? And if she thinks his lack of response is a good enough response, then to me, that's being a hypocrite based upon the past comments she made on other situations similar to this. Okay, thank you. Last Did you question, want to take another question? Okay, this next yeah. question comes from Austin Westfall at 23 ABC. Your line is open. Another you, great time. station inside my district. Go ahead. Really appreciate that, Leader. Uh, thank you for your time. I have another uh, local question. Two, two of the biggest priorities in the 23rd district are the agriculture and the oil industries. Um, during these times, it seems there's a lot of uncertainty coming from both uh, large and small oil businesses locally, and there's also been safety concerns uh, from ag workers who are working out in the fields amid the pandemic. Um, in what ways have you been pushing for uh, 23rd district priorities in Washington and uh, otherwise? Thank you very much. And the first we have to start with too, and for those who don't know my district, it is number one in uh, value in ag in the entire nation. And as a county, it produces the second most amount of oil than any county in the country. Our oil is thicker, so we get a lower price for it, it's a little harder. First of all, I wanna thank everybody in that industry, right? Because what are they doing? The food supply, making sure it comes from America, not from another country, and that it's safe. So they're out in the forefront. So we're making sure we work through from PPE and others uh, and how to be able to do it. We did a number of calls early on where I brought the CDC in and others advising of how we walk through and how we treat this. From the oil industry, we watched two, uh, two things hit us that actually became the perfect storm, one of the worst scenarios we have seen prior. Well, from the virus, we watched an economic downturn, so that lowered the price. Secondly, we watched what Saudi Arabia and Russia did. I had many meetings with the president. Um, the president engaged, literally getting Saudi Arabia and Russia back to the table where they're able to decide on a cut in production 
um, that's still, a, that's 25% of the problem, 75% of the problem is uh, the economy itself, supply and demand. We have too much supply out there, even the ability to storage, working on, uh, I tried to get more SPRO, um, Strategic Petroleum Reserve, talked to the president, even in the Oval that day where he made a decision to buy more. We tried to put that in to uh, the CARES Act, the Democrats kicked it out. That's one of the things that the speaker got kicked out when she added more money to the Kennedy Center. Uh, it was in prior, and that's the holdup what got removed. That hurt us as well. A lot of energy jobs in America that hurt. Um, I went back to the meeting in the White House uh, in the cabinet room with the president. We met with other um, oil uh, leaders, or energy leaders, I would say. So we continue to work with them. I was just talking to one of the CEOs of the company, just uh, the local company today. This is going to be a real challenge for us. Um, of those 30 million, a lot of being laid off here in this community. So we've got to get the energy price in a better, more stable position. We've got to get the supply and demand better. Economics, the economy getting stronger. Uh, our ability to open up safely does different items for that. I look within the first quarter GDP numbers, a lot of the more than half of that is within the medical community. So if we can get um, our numbers would be better if they could have selective surgeries, do that in a safe manner. There's ways to go about doing, could you designate one hospital COVID and the rest could be open up to work. Um, I, I think there's a lot of things going on, but this is a, a, almost a daily discussion with the White House and our ability to do it. And if Congress could be back working, these are items that we could be dealing with there as well. Uh, that's why it's so critical and important. It doesn't deal with one party or another. It deals with the entire country. Uh, I appreciate you being with me today, all of you. Uh, I will continue to hold these. I want to keep you apprised of it. I look forward to the day we could be back um, in our own press conferences in a safe manner and uh, that we have a vaccine. We've got some real promising items going. I've got another conference call with all of our members today. We're bringing in a number of companies to get an update on where they are in antibodies and vaccines and others. We want to make sure there's no government slowdown in this process, but the safety is there continued as well as how we can solve this. I do believe fundamentally the ingenuity of America will not only solve this problem, but solve it for the rest of the world too. So thank you all. Stay safe and God bless.